So it's a great pleasure and honour to be here um, talking to you. Ruth um, persuaded and suggested me that this would be a good opportunity uh, to talk to a, a society and a professional body who cares also deeply about um, interdisciplinary work, but also at its heart is about trying to understand how humans, how humans in complex environments make decisions, how organisations do similar, and how in a world of a blend of digital and human capabilities, uh, we're to understand that. So I'm going to give you, uh, in part, a, a historical reprise of how I came into um, the, the subject area. And I guess the other thing to say is, uh, Alan, wear a number of hats, um, a chair of the Open Data Institute, um, principal of Jesus College, um, and also uh, a professor of computer science. Um, and through my time, I guess I have always uh, been fascinated by uh, the fundamental question of what is it that constitutes uh, our intelligence. Uh, actually, there were two other questions. Uh, could we build intelligent machines and was there any intelligence out there? That seems to be kind of a, a really nice trio of, of questions around the nature of intelligence. So um, to start, um, I start usually, I, I like to kind of contextualise this and much of this is known to you in a sense. Uh, but it's always good to call it out explicitly. So uh, things really disrupt. Changes that we look back on as historically hugely significant, when what was formerly scarce becomes abundant. The agrarian revolution, at some point, it's argued, it's often pushed further and further back, you see. At some point, as we, we, we move from being hunter-gatherers, or didn't move entirely, it turns out that was again a blended process, as we began to grow cereal crops, populations grew, all sorts of changes in societal structure and the decisions that we faced. The uh, f famous uh, other quoted example is the invention of movable type, the explosion of book uh, books and uh, printing presses and the ability to access um, literally a wider readership and indeed for literacy to take off and expand. The other well-known revolution was the industrial one, the one that was born here uh, in these islands. The ability to take uh, resources and produce what were formerly rather scarce uh, manufactured items. And most recently, we've witnessed the emergence of both information uh, 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 superabundance and computing uh, power abundance. So let's just think about that. And again, this is, a, this is, a, this is a, a, an illustration well known to many of you, the famous kind of plot of Moore's Law. This log-log um, uh, plot is essentially describing an exponential increase in power. And whenever we're feeling too pleased with ourselves in artificial intelligence or uh, the computing industry or some aspect of applied technology, we should take our hats off to the electrical engineers. Electrical engineers have pretty well given us um, an uninterrupted run of doubling the power of our computers about every 15 months, effectively. So, um, and I track this, when I first went to university, which seems a dreadfully long time ago, but was about 1974, um, the, the chip, insofar as it exists, Motorola 6800, boasted about 4,100 transistors. It's a kind of a measure of capacity just five years later, an increase of well over an order of magnitude. Um, by 89, the Intel 8486 had over a million, and we go on. Uh, the Intel copper mine, this is a, 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 a chip that underlay uh, much uh, of the computing revolution that powered the internet, 21 million processors. The Skylake in, in, in this uh, machine, actually not exactly this machine, but uh, uh, my previous one, had virtually 2 billion transistors. And the phone I'm carrying in my pocket has 3 billion. Now that is to give you a sense that we struggle to understand how exponents change the world. People, it's cheap talk, exponential change. This is exponential change. It has changed the world, okay? It's changed the world because Algorithms that were formerly inconceivable become possible. Algorithms that were conceived but would just run impossibly slowly are, are improved. And of course, it's testament 
to a great deal of ingenious work in algorithm design, scheduling kind of what the M does, optimization that we can do even more with the power we have, but that power has made a huge amount of difference. And that power at the price we can now receive it made huge differences. And of course, there's lots of exponents, as we know, in the world of computing. This is Kreider's law. This is a log-log law. This is measuring roughly um, the density storage, the capacity to record information. The thing on the left, that big massive cabinet, uh, is an IBM uh, um, 38, um, 3380 cabinet, which had eight 2.5 gigabyte disks. It cost a million dollars. 2.5 gigabytes times eight. It weighed 2,000 kilograms. The thumb drives on the right are bigger and more capable. That's an extraordinary revolution. It means that all sorts of things that we claim in our field about what will and will not be possible tend to, tend to come about much sooner than we expect. Part of the reason that Deep Blue defeated Kasparov and set off the first, one of the early waves, I should say, of hysteria around AI beat the world's best chess player was the compute power, the ability to search millions of moves deep into the game tree. The reason that we're impressed by AlphaGo, and it's an impressive achievement, the, the uh, DeepMind uh, program that is uh, beating the world's best Go players, is the extraordinary ability to go even deeper into larger search spaces uh, and to compute functions across <coughs> millions and millions of component nodes with millions of data sets to now take us into spaces which we opined would be difficult to uh, solve using brute force. Brute force and a little insight is a powerful method. The question is where you get your little insight from and what insight constitutes and we'll talk about that more in the rest of the lecture. So I wanted to say a little bit about where where my trajectory came into this. I started off uh, when I um, got intrigued by the notion of mathematizing thought. Um, from philosophy and psychology, I was attracted to a PhD in AI at the Department of AI, as it was then, in Edinburgh in 1978. And there I, I looked essentially at uh, how we might build uh, computational uh, uh, discourse understanding systems. And as I left there, the first um, injection of serious money into AI was in the UK called the Alvi program, was partly in response to a perceived threat from the uh, Japanese to put us all out of work. <laughs> all the jobs were going to disappear. Uh, the robots would take over. Um, and uh, we worked a lot, particularly in the UK, around the idea of expert or knowledge-based systems. And this is from a system that I built whilst I was actually in Nottingham uh, uh, to try and elicit uh, a sufficient amount of operator knowledge from people who flew, hel flew helicopters to uh, help in the assessment of information that were coming in as signals into their radar systems. So this was a situation assessment system. It was a classic uh, system of its time. It was based around rule-based and uncertainty calculus, essentially, an, in an integration of, of uncertain reasoning with rule-based reasoning. A little later, I, I got my first taste of, um, of, uh, of, 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 of commercial exploitation when we, again, at Nottingham, working with the Department of Chemical Engineering, built a system to move from the diagrams on the left to three-dimensional layout on the right. Um, that was a successful teaching company that was bought by a, uh, a, a process uh, uh, um, company, a process technology company in, in the US called Aspen Technology, who still use this technology. And what it taught me was just how hard general AI was always going to be. It was a form of expert system, we had rule-based components, we had a lot of constraint-based reasoning actually in that system, because in design, many of the things you're trying to do is not violate constraints, not put something that is very hot next to something that might ignite and blow up, is that you would want to minimize piping in uh, one sense to, uh, to, 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 so as not to lose too much heat loss in the process, but you have to have enough such that you can gain access to do basic safety work. So there are these very interesting trade-offs um, in these kind of systems. But the thing it also taught me was that in the diagram on the left, at a crucial position, there are no pumps. There are some pumps in it, but in certain process positions, 
And any engineer looking at that would surmise that what you're going to do is exploit gravity flow. You will put one thing higher than another and the liquid will flow. That is common sense engineering knowledge. That is not explicit in the diagram on the left. How do you get a machine to learn that? Okay, uh, how do you build that capability in other than essentially grafting on a naive physics, a, a sense of how uh, the mechanics uh, work in a model-based way. So as I was going through this trajectory, I was experiencing the sense that you need a rich set of methods if you're going to actually uh, solve significant problems in the world. And, and along the way, it got diverted into uh, robotics. That was a very trendy thing in the early 2000s. It was just too interesting to look at how actual neural networks worked. Working with a colleague, we did some interesting work on, on trying to build um, uh, visual systems that somewhat approximated the way that actual uh, human uh, neural networks organize themselves in the visual cortex. But I was always attracted to the notion of explicit um, um, structural knowledge-based approaches to, to AI. And rather late in the day, and I would say that most of AI was rather late in the day to this, uh, became interested in the web. Um, we had got interested in the web in AI, we had distributed AI systems, but the web at scale with thousands and then tens of thousands and then millions of users had kind of almost escaped our attention for a good of time. Uh, it was a thin application layer on the internet. Well, nice to have, but how is it going to change the world? Well, boy, were we wrong there. And as I moved to Southampton, I uh, became interested in the idea of could you inject some of the methods of AI into the web at scale? And this was the so-called semantic web project. I became aware of, uh, of Tim's interest in this area. We began to, to begin our collaboration in that space. And just to kind of demystify the semantic web, people say, where's it gone? Well, I'll, I'll, refer, I'll, I'll mention that uh, as, I, as I introduce the concept. But here is a web page. Early days of the, um, the web, you always had them in exotic places because you had to persuade people to go to them. So Hawaii was a favorite uh, location for a lot of web conferences. If I look at that web page, I can see that it's got different fonts. It's got a different layout. There's a picture. We interpret all of that, okay, very quickly. Um, if I was to open up a traditional web page, I'd see all that information about the font size, the colour of the font, where the position of that syntax, it's the syntax of layout in a way. It's not, it's not what it's about, it's not what it means. But you know by inspection that that is the name of a conference. Um, that's the kind of thing it is. There is a URL for that conference. Um, down here is a picture of a youthful Tim Berners-Lee, and he is a featured speaker. All of that you're extracting, what if you could inject some of that basic representational meaning into the web page itself? So the whole enterprise of the semantic web at this stage was to, was to take a little semantics and make it go a long way. Okay. Um, and that was surprisingly successful. We developed a whole set of languages to express these relationships. So if you were to open up that page at that time, there would be a markup language that wasn't about the size of the font and the color of, and the placement of the image. It would be about the vocabulary that describes academic conferences that you'd expect to have a speaker or a table of contents or a location or a web page address for um, some other part of the workshop. The ontology or vocabulary of, of conferences is predictable. You can develop a markup language for it. And if you then, if you like, encapsulate the bits of the page that are about that part of the uh, meaning of an event or a conference, you put some meaning into the web page, which machine mining, machine algorithms can exploit. That is the semantic web. We had grand plans for it. Um, it it's done very well. Uh, use it all the time. They call it the knowledge graph. So when you type in your result and you have all that structured information, uh, when you're searching for an individual or a place or event, they're using those representations, those relational links between various things that they're excavating on the web to good effect. And as we got more engaged, as I got more engaged in the web, and as uh, Tim and I and others were working, Wendy Hall, Jim Hendler, Danny Weitzner and others, we became, I mean, it's completely 
Sometimes the technology is so beguiling, the power of the computers, the scale so enticing that you forget the completely obvious point. This is about people. This is about social processes. Um, and the web, the elephant in the room, was that the web was changing the world profoundly. And we had very little understanding. We understood the technical protocols. We understood what we were trying to do with the semantic web. But how and why might it take off? How and why are people um, effectively augmenting their decision making on the web? And on occasion, collaborating at very large scale to solve problems. What do we understand of that? And of course, that took me back to my, to my uh, original interdisciplinary interests in psychology. And it seems very obvious now when we were calling this out. We were trying to define a new science. And it, but, I mean, people would have a real go at this web science. It's like, well, people think computer science is a bit dodgy, uh, I have to say. Uh, but I, would, I, I think we can put up a stout defense for that now. Um, I remember talking to Morris Wilkes, the great late Morris Wilkes, uh, who said, I've been an engineer a scientist and I know the difference and uh, I, I kind of I he had a real point and so we're not going to argue about the niceties of engineering versus science they're complementary they're deeply kind of related but the point was in all of that don't forget people don't forget the social dimension so what we were doing in web science when we launched the kind of call to web science it all seems completely obvious now which was uh, let's pay attention disruptive effects of the web in society, they will have unintended consequences. Unless we get in and understand these interactions, we will be surprised in the future. This was 2006, okay, um, when uh, a number of us kind of said, let's call this, let's convene the study and give it in the same way that environmental science convenes a range of methods to look at, or climate science, to look at a phenomena of material relevance. So this is Schmidt at the time, Google CEO, uh, pretty, next, pretty big next step in the evolution of information. Google would. I mean, you can well understand why they will be behind it, why we're getting. Uh, the um, VP at, um, at IBM, um, Irving, uh, was, was also similarly kind of enthused by the idea. And as we were beginning to present this, I was very um, struck by the um, citations for the awards this evening. Um, talked about the ability to, to try and bring um, quantitative and qualitative methods together, mixed method approaches. This was a mixed method approach. We first of all had to explain it to our computer science colleagues who were thinking, this is, this is, this is computer science, okay? Having worried for, lots, for a long time about what is and whether they were science, um, quite understandably, you know, how do you make sense of the, um, uh, how do you articulate the challenge in a way that you can, can recruit the brightest and the best to study some of the web science questions. So what were they? Well, before what were the questions, let's just, uh, I remember early on I came up with what came to be known as the butterfly diagram, which was just an attempt to sketch the elements of the method set that you might need. You can argue about multi-trans or interdisciplinary. People do. They, they will literally have the same argument about whether or not this term is stable. But what we were trying to call out was that don't be surprised in trying to make sense of the web that you might reach for a technique or a method from evolutionary biology or epidemiology. I use both of those examples because we have done and they're very successful too. Or that you might need to understand something about how legal jurisdiction works. And it's extraordinary how often we end up building and deploying systems of significance and are surprised uh, that we haven't thought about whether, well, an ethical issue or should we have thought about whether or not we were engaging with individual sociology or psychology in the appropriate way. It's, of course, a very different world now because we're living daily with many of the challenges that we were imagine were coming along. It wasn't as if these challenges weren't there in 2006. They were there. There just wasn't the convening of a whole range of subject methodologies onto those problems with that expertise. That has completely changed. Um, the other thing that I think is kind of um, interesting is that people are always worried about what isn't this? You know, websites used to be everything. So what aren't? 
And we always try to say, well, look, this isn't strictly about the union of these disciplines, but it's more than the intersection. There are some emergent uh, approaches and questions that you will see, in a some sense, uniquely manifested on the web. Well, um, let's look at some examples. But before that, the other thing that was obvious was that the other exponent, we talk about the technical exponents, but of course the human exponent is there. That's our population. Uh, it's pretty striking when you see it like that. And we have these other exponents, the, out of in the amount of information being generated in the world. One of the challenges we actually have is that when we try and observe and analyse anything on the web at scale, it is at scale. Okay, so we have a, a significant challenge in sampling it and analysing it. This is just uh, intercepting some of the, 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 the tweets, the Twitter stream, essentially, and trying to analyse it uh, um, for interesting patterns. Um, in fact, we've got versions that I won't show you here, which uh, include deleted tweets, which are always very interesting. Uh, the profane and the profound, they're all in there together. The fake and the real. Um, the, the challenge is also, of course, that how can we as researchers get access to all of this? Actually, there are uh, public-facing uh, samples of this, but the entire torrent will cost you a lot of money. Some aspects of the web are entirely close to us. We don't, as a research community, have access to the underlying data that will allow us to do the science. That is problematic, I would submit. But anyway, let's just come back and look at a bit more of the journey. The striking thing about the web and the web at scale is that, and it's one of the features that people have uh, alluded to with data science and big data, is that at scale, structure emerges. Now, there's a big argument about how much underpinning theory you need to make sense of that structure. This is an interesting graphic I use to illustrate this. This, is, this looks like it might be uh, light pollution from a satellite, actually, when you look at it. Um, actually, what it is, is a... Um, it, 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 it's, it's, it's a negative of, of, of data that represents the geospatial coordinates of Flickr uploads. That's the free photo app, okay? Where you upload it, it, it notes the, 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 the GPS coordinates of where the picture was taken. If you squint your eyes up, what do you see there? It's here. It's literally here. That's London, with the River Thames and the bridges crossing it. That's because, actually, and that's the GPS coordinates for Flickr. Okay. And it's an exactly obvious observation that there are enough people around now, um, at scale, doing this kind of thing, that you get emergent structure. People have to be you know, laid out along the avenues. And not only that, they tend to cluster and take photographs where? Well, they take them at the tourist spots. So I can now exploit the fact that all of these, I can tell you the, 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 the top uh, tourist spots just by inspecting that open source feed. This ability to exploit both semantics and intent from large scale data on the web is the thing that has powered the evolution of the web and now web science and the insights we come from it. It's quite correct, I think, to say that we didn't invent web science, I wish we'd invented this. Um, this is the page rank algorithm. Age and Brin, younger version, this was their both engineering genius, because they worked out how to repurpose commoditized uh, rack servers, and the mathematics to understand how you could essentially take the pages on the web and organize and analyze them, understand the eigenvectors of this very large data structure, and work out the most relevant, the most important pages and the ones that link to it and have a virtual process of estimating importance through link density. The connection graph of the web, essentially, and compute it. Well, that's done rather well for them. Okay. Of course, the real genius to work out how to monetize it and, and sell the advertising. What they were exploiting, of course, was huge amounts of human labor in marking up hyperlinks. And humans mark up hyperlinks that reflect relevance and interest. And so essentially, there were this web science inside was to see that you could mathematize a sense of relevance and human interest on the web scale. 
And when we began our web science question, we, this is back in 2006, you can see that, that again how quickly ideas change. One of the things that was the um, idea of the day was to try and understand the blogosphere, that people were blogging, increasing numbers. Nobody quite understand why it had suddenly taken off at a particular moment in time, but they were certainly noticing it had, and they were beginning to want to understand its structure, its, uh, its connection graph. Who were the super um, influencers, the super hubs, the super <coughs> connected in this graph? A lot of network and, uh, analysis done on this. We also observed that there was something very interesting in the evolution of, 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 of if you like, uh, blogging. It was when the a very simple technical innovation was made. It was the trackback or the ping. The ping was a piece of social recognition by another blog writer to your blog. It got you credit. Incorporating that ping back into the underlying blog infrastructure transformed the blogosphere into a social incentive environment. Now, these kind of analyses have proved to be very interesting across the web. Um, one of the most interesting ones currently is to try and understand the structure, for example, of social networks, because social networks are at huge scale, if you can get the data, and if you can sample it in a way uh, that allows you to do, in a certain sense, uh, fair and, and balanced experiments, but that's another set of methodological issues. What was beginning to happen uh, literally in the mid-2000s onwards, is that people beginning to apply theories from sociology and psychology to look for structure in social networks. And so here are, here are literally what you can think of as network motifs for uh, particular ways in which people might associate in a social network. You might associate because you're interested in exchanging information. You might exchange... Uh, because you like to be with people like you, <coughs> homophily. You might exchange, you might be uh, integrated into a social network because of your collective action of common goals. You might be moving um, into a network based on pure self-interest. These kinds of fundamental organisational um, principles were things that people could begin to go and examine at network scale. And um, as I'll, I'll mention a little later, we've begun to see the real benefits at scale, not just for understanding the web, but for sociology, for example, to understand itself better. Along the way, there were interesting insights. There was the famous example, you may remember, this is the famous example of, you know, if you are uh, um, essentially six degrees of separation, or however you want to imagine it might be, um, how does that work? Um, and the famous experiment uh, uh, um, that was conducted where somebody sought to get a package from one side of the United States to another just by referring on to people you might know might be able to get it further. And could you get it not just to the other side of the continent, but to a specified addressee? And the, the work that was done on this showed that the notion of social proximity and the knowledge we have um, and the extent to which our social proximity graphs are decentralized and how they work in locales and then have farther outposts give you a almost certain route to solve these sorts of problems. Essentially it's a piece of routing analysis. Uh, the mystery of the package from east to west coast was seen to be understood. Not always, not certainly, but in the great majority of cases. <coughs> this is uh, one of my favorite kind of uh, I would call him a web scientist, I'm sure he would call himself a network scientist. Sinan Aral, uh, currently at MIT, um, when, um, when I knew him, a, a young adjunct professor, um, he's done some really interesting uh, work, recently published in, in Nature Communications, recently, and you may have come across it, on, it's been quite widely reported. This is um, exercise contagion in a global social network. The great thing about the form of social network analysis we can now do and the data we can get at scale and the other data sets we have available is we can ask, ask, ask the most interesting questions. His question was uh, whether or not actually um, weather patterns influenced uh, running behaviours. So he walked about, he looked at how people uh, were run, running and jogging in the United States. Well, they do, surprise, surprise. But more interestingly, how did other people in your social network influence your running behaviour? 
Now, here's the interesting thing. If you were socially related to somebody who ran, kind of like you ran, jogged six kilometers, and you were friends with somebody who ran seven kilometers, and suppose you run a bit further the next day, how does that affect things? He has data at scale, significantly robust data over millions of subjects that shows you actually what happens. The slower runners influence the faster runners, not the other way around. So if I'm a slower runner, buddy up with somebody else, and I go out and I run a bit faster than normal, my faster running buddy has got to run faster still. Okay? It doesn't work the other way around. A male runner will affect a male runner. A female runner will not affect a male runner. What's that expressing? It seems to be expressing some quite deep-seated ways in which our social contagion works. Okay. I recommend the paper. It's, it's a beautiful study. And it's, it's exemplary, I think, of a whole area where asking questions about fundamental social dispositions is now possible at scale with the tools and methods we have. And of course, the question here is an exercise, but what we want to understand is how contagion works in other contexts, political view, or uh, an interest in particular technologies, or adoption of other kinds of behaviours. The problem with, and the problem that we all face in this area is actually data. Um, one reason that we love Wikipedia is that It's open. Wikipedia is a great example of a web science drosophila. We can study it. Every click, every revision made on every page in the history of Wikipedia is available to be downloaded and logged and intercepted. So we can see through time the users, where they're from, what they're writing about, what they're doing, what they're analysing. And again, I. It's, it is almost an injunction in general to say it becomes hugely important for a science like this to advance, for methods to advance, to be able to have access to these open data sources. And that kind of ties me back to another theme that I've always been passionate about, the extent we can make some of this data safely and publicly available and open. So here's a question that Wikipedia became preoccupied with. Uh, a little while ago, there was a very uh, influential study by w Wikipedia's own researchers that seemed to show that the whole project might be in danger because there was a notable decline around about 2007, late 2000, early 2008, in the number of volunteer editors who hold this whole thing together. And um, they became very long at one stage. The question was, if you guys know so much about web science, Tell us whether this is an inevitable decline. What, what, can, you, can you actually understand anything about the phenomena? Um, and what we were able to do, without going into the detailed modelling, but to give you a sense of this, we actually looked at um, a number of things. Um, um, one thing we looked at was, the, um, was not just the core Wikipedia pages, but there's a thing in Wikipedia, associated with Wikipedia effort called Wiki, Wiki Projects, where lots of specialists... Um, topics are dealt with and where specialist communities of practice come together. <laughs> what we could see very clearly is that Wikipedia was in an extremely healthy state, but what you were noticing was that in some of the core, the central curated core of Wikipedia, whose kind of uh, uh, connection graph is kind of partly reflected there in, in, in degree, SCC is the stable central core, these are the pages that have got so much attention, have become authoritative that the amount of work on them, in some sense, they're maintained, but it's not like the whole new authorial process. So you want to get some measure for what's happening in new emerging areas as opposed to the entrenched core elements. And again, looking at the structure and size of, of, of efforts at scale like Wikipedia has become a, an area generated many PhDs and, and a lot of interesting papers. Everything from the shape and structure of the, of the Wikipedia uh, uh, graph to how communities are maintained, what values incentives. I mean, the question about that is why do people bother? Why do people actually do uh, this work? Um, it's intensive. What, 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 is the, what is the social incentivization structure? So in understanding a phenomenon at scale, you absolutely have to reach for quantitative analysis, 
and qualitative anthropological and ethnographic studies as well. So I'll kind of, moving on to, to, to kind of close out the talk, I, I would want to talk a little bit about more recent work that, that I've been doing looking at um, um, uh, web science. And the way we've been characterizing this more recently is in terms of, um, of what we call social machines, which are new kinds of assemblages, and they're not new, they're familiar to us, of, of humans and machine algorithms and data sets at scale to solve problems. Um, there's a very nice study uh, that got people onto this. Again, it was, a, uh, it was launched in the US. It was a, a, a DARPA challenge from the uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. So uh, the problem analog here will be very obvious, but if you don't know it, it is very compelling. Imagine your task was to find eight objects somewhere in the continental United States of America. You don't know where, they're somewhere. Sounds a hard problem. Well, what they did is they tethered eight balloons in different, they were quite big, <laughs> in various parts of the continental United States. It's a big place, okay. Um, that was the challenge. They set various research groups. The winning team from MIT found them all in well under 24 hours. How did they do that? They built a platform that integrated essentially the same insights from the, you know, getting the package from the left, the, the, the east coast to the, right, the, the west coast. They incentivized, they incentivized people to participate, to reach out to people they, they knew who they thought would be able to reach out to other people who would be bothered to go and look. And they incentivized them using essentially a kind of a pyramid scheme, so a recursive incentive which was uh, 4,000 pounds if you found a balloon, uh, 2,000 uh, to the person who put you on to the finder, 1,000 to put you on to the finder's finder. I mean, it basically recursively went down. Everybody got something. It wasn't much, in, actually, the, the, the steps were interesting. Um, and they used Facebook and Twitter. They found actually 10 balloons, 10 balloons. They found them all in nine hours. Okay. Their biggest problem were fake balloons. Okay. So they tell us, they tell us that fake news is, 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 is a new challenge. Not at all. What was happening? Other teams were trying to spoof the other kind of uh, teams. False balloons. And there was a lot of misreporting. There were a lot of false positives. Uh, actually, quite a lot of the clever engineering went into uh, working out how to do that. But what it shows you is something very interesting. It's a, it's a thesis we use quite widely in web science, which is that no one knows everything, everyone knows something. And if you can kind of mobilize um, the problem-solving context, you can do extraordinary things. This is Ushahidi, which has been used in many contexts. In the original Kenyan elections, it was put together literally in a week uh, to allow people to report outbreaks of violence in the Kenyan elections. And it turned the world's eyeballs onto the problem and was largely responsible for bringing political pressure to bear. These systems where you're looking to somehow engineer the task, the incentives, and enough algorithmic and computational platform to solve the problem is, I think, one of the really new challenges for web sites. The question is, how do you specify, how do you do the requirements analysis in a context like this in a classic fashion? We're getting to be quite good at it. Um, this is an example from the uh, the Kenyan, uh, the, the, sorry, the, the, the Nepalese uh, earthquake in uh, when uh, there was a massive earthquake in um, uh, nine, well, just about oh, 15, 18 months ago. They did a large amount of, of, of area was destroyed. They brought together 4,000 mappers, part of the open street map community, and they together with high resolution satellite and uh, supporting um, uh, software essentially took 48 hours to map out around about 13, 14,000 roads of mi miles of roads, about 110,000 buildings, uh, essentially trying to backfill the detailed cartography and the detailed estimation uh, so they could then go in and do subsequent damage assessments. So actually, again, uh, very interesting to see what's possible when you mobilize people in this way. And the thing to note about these systems is that 
They work because they're solved at scale by humans participating. This is not pure AI, okay? Very often the AI is used to help solve some aspect of the problem, like uh, um, uh, a feature of imag image recognition or some presentation or integration of data. You mobilize people in a timely fashion, you incentivize them to, to participate. You're incentivized to participate the more other people participate, so there's that kind of uh, 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 reinforcing mechanism. You're able to generate large amounts of relevant data, so bringing your data assets together very quickly. You've got some confidence in the quality of the data. You've got some trust in the agents. And this is what's very interesting, is how we do work in, um, in, in the current era to believe and trust and, and, and have methods of, of trust that allow information to assume um, a significant role for the true information it may or may not be. Um, working cross-platform, I, I would say here, wouldn't I, um, particularly exploiting the power of open. A lot of these uh, large-scale social machines are premised on a public good philosophy using open standards, sometimes open source software, but very often um, open licenses. The data is available for all to use. Um, and examples like that, here's a good one. Um, I like this one. This is a, a citizen science uh, social machine. Actually, it's a game, the way it was set up originally. Um, what you're seeing here is uh, various bits of um, optic neurons. Back to the thing, when we built the robot to try and recognize the visual world, well, this is actually real human visual neuron. Um, and what they're trying to do is build detailed maps of actual real cortex. Um, they've built AI programs to uh, do some of the grunt work, but they make mistakes. They often can't trace through the actual fine-grained connectivity. People are very good at doing it. People are recruited in this citizen science job to improve on what the machines can do because of their ability to look and understand how potential connection uh, networks work. We've got an exquisite sense somehow to intuit what this very uh, complex nerve uh, uh, projection, whether am I or not it might go through a particular piece of three-dimensional space. And so when the machines often can't see that, uh, the human can bridge the gap. The other famous one is Zooniverse, again from Oxford, where people are used to help classify and categorize huge amounts of information, originally coming in from astronomy, but now increasingly from all sorts of other science domains. And we're trying to understand great things, citizen science, because just like Wikipedia, we can get hold of the data in an open fashion. It's open to us. So we've been looking, for example, at the... Um, at the uh, at the structure, uh, for example, of the contribution space in uh, Zooniverse, people who are classifying all these astronomical images, how much they communicate with each other, do they form subgroups, are they particularly, uh, um, particularly um, uh, influenced by uh, particular images they're seeing, um, to the extent that we can now run machine learning on the large-scale users of this citizen science project. So we have millions of people of thousands, certainly uh, um, when we're running some of these experiments, who are classifying particular objects. Typically, you're asked, to, what kind of object is this? What kind of galaxy type is it? And they can be trained to recognize and do these tasks very quickly with a training set. We've got hundreds and hundreds of thousands of these classifications. And then we look at how well the people are doing. And not everybody's as good as everybody else. And some people reflect a certain cognitive bias. So some people are over-optimistic in seeing exotic galaxies when they're not there. Some people keep on conflating one galaxy type with another. And so we can actually map the type of cognitive style that our user has through seeing their classifications. And of course, then we can assign them particular tasks in the future, potentially. It's an interesting idea that we're now getting enough data at scale that we can begin to actually organize the space uh, of tasks that we're allocating to individuals. So my team, this is not done on your own. This is some of my team, uh, at, for some of them now, uh, at, at, uh, uh, some of them also from Southampton, where we're trying to get these analytics done at scale. And I just want to say, perhaps in closing, uh, to bring us up to date with where our current concern is. It's a web science challenge. It's one that Tim is very passionate about. It's around the notion of, well, yes, an open web. OK, so net neutrality. Um, if, as in some countries, you currently have to pay 
for premium connectivity. It means that certain services that you might like to watch over the, the web become much more difficult to use because they're highly bandwidth intensive. The whole idea that you don't choose as a provider of connectivity uh, what, um, what content is throttled at what, uh, to what extent uh, is one of the key ideas because once you have that key in your control the fear is that people will not just start to throttle in terms of the amount of usage but the nature and type of the content. But the whole issue of how we get control over our use of services on the web or indeed our use of data on our services on the web, or indeed the data on anything using to connect to the internet. And perhaps the most striking example of that is are our mobiles. Um, people have been predicting, of course, the end of the web forever, saying the mobile, mobile apps will kill it off. Um, you just have to understand that, in a sense, the web re-manifests itself all the time in new contexts. The, 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 the extent to which uh, we are still and will use for the foreseeable future these fundamental web standards. If we are driven into a world in which the standards do become app specific, do become platform specific, then there's another reason we might fragment the web. That is another area of study for the web, is how might it fragment. Um, here's some work we've been done in, doing on, on trying to understand where the data <laughs> on this supercomputer in your pocket is actually going, right? So, I don't know how many apps you've got on your phone, you might not know, but they're all running and some of them are chirping away and sending data to various people when either you fire the application up or you don't. Do you know? Have you any idea? Um, this is exciting work we've just got going where we've actually, um, we've harvested, um, this won't go out just yet, will it? Um, but we, 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 have, we have well over a million applications from the Android Play Store, which we have taken and analysed and statically analysed and in some cases dynamically analysed to see where the data is going. What are the destinations in the world? For what reasons? What are the intermediaries? What are the third parties? Do we know anything about them? This is an arms race because as we're speaking, app developers are actually trying to make that hard to find out. They're encrypting various of the libraries. There are various ways in which the third parties that are shunting your data off to somewhere else to be processed are not wanting to necessarily declare what the nature of that organization is or who owns them. It's really interesting as a social problem. Where is your data going? At what jurisdiction? For what reason? For advertising? For analytics? Should you have any control over that? Are you happy about that? We are not in control of this conversation even in the slightest. So one of the interesting things I think for, for, for us as web scientists is to think about what it would be to put consumers and citizens back in control of that conversation. And to leave you with a sense of the questions that we still find intriguing uh, even after 10 or so years of, of, of talking about the science of the web. There's plenty of them to go at. Many of them, if you thought about it, you know, how on earth would you, you know, how can a million people reach consensus on the web? If one person in the world knows the answer, how can the person with the question find them? These are grand questions that still challenge us, even with all of the technology and methods we have. This is an interesting one. This is the neutrality question. So if I change the toll on roads, Alan will know much about this, uh, the, the way tilt is used in city context, people can tell me the effect. If I see a differential charging on the web, who can tell me the impact? Do we know the answer to that question? Okay. It's a much more com complicated and multifaceted question. It's not just about traffic flow one in one context. How do we answer that question? And of course, the question du jour is this. Now, I don't believe anybody really believes Hilly Crillington actually adopted an alien baby, um, but that is some fake news. The question we're now facing is, how, as web scientists, can we understand enough about social contagion, who believes who? How can we understand enough about the provenance of content on the web so that we begin to apply methods and algorithms or even imagine a technology that could begin to do the truth checking, the fact checking that is now uh, claimed to be so important? And if all of that was true, do we understand enough about the nature 
of mis and disinformation as a social practice to actually uh, get a grip of that. And all of this is happening so quickly. All of this is happening so quickly. Um, and sometimes, even as people who feel on the right side of the question, we find ourselves doing some perverse things. So we ran, a, we ran an experiment that got us a rather uh, a, a paper in, in one of the uh, top conferences, the CHI conference, on information dissimulation. So the idea is, if they're all at it, if they're all taking our data, what can we possibly do about it? When you put out chaff, you put out all sorts of misinformation to actually try and camouflage your tracks. What happens in a world where that arms race is happening, in which we're actually actively polluting the information space out of a sincere intent to protect our privacy? How does that work? Um, so... Um, uh, I'm happy to talk more about that. We've got one or two very nice demoed applications of that. Uh, the, um, yes, uh, things that basically make up all sorts of plausible entries on your diary so you can appear to be somewhere you're not. Uh, but we won't go into possible uses of that. Um, websites matters. Um, and I would just say that it seems to me nobody doubts that anymore. Uh, we are seeing a uh, huge manifestation of how the world of the web intercepts everything we do. And I talk about the web now, I could talk about the internet. I could talk about the upcoming internet of things, which of course in some respects is, is even more challenging because we don't have a standardized space yet in which we can even ask some of the questions about how that ecosystem is evolving. But I think that's enough for me talking at you. Thank you very much.